Hi FlossTube friends, I'm Sherry Colorado Cross Stitcher here on YouTube, also on Instagram, and I have a shop in Loveland, Colorado, and also coloradocrossstitcher.com. Welcome to my channel. This is my channel about my own personal cross stitching with a little bit of shop news at the end. This one's going to be fun because we've got market stuff coming out and we've got market pre-orders up on the website, so it's a fun time of year. But let's get into stitching. So it's been five weeks since I last floss tube, and I usually try and do four, but last weekend I was out of town. So five weeks. Let me show you my book of days, which I like to do each time. I hope you guys are keeping book of days uh, calendars if that's something that you like to do. So we have January finished, and again I put my starts and the information on the fabrics over on this side, and then I have ready for February, a little bit of February stitching done in there. And one other thing I did, you know last time I told you that I got behind on all of my finishes. I like to take pictures of my finishes. I take the pictures with my phone and then I use a um, Kodak zip printer, I think it's called. I link to it in the show notes um, below. So it prints out little two by three photos, which is perfect for something like this. But Remember I said I got behind on my fil photographing my finishes, so I, I'm trying to stay up with it. Actually, those are new patterns I'm going to show you in a minute. But what I wanted to show you is I put a little post-it note down in there to add additional finishes that I'm going to wait until I get them framed because I think that'll make a nicer picture. So you might want to do that if you are trying to keep track of your finishes. And let's see if I did anything else. Well, I put a fun page on here. A fun photo. This was in California last weekend. I went and visited my Joy Tribe friends, which I'll talk about Joy Tribe sometime uh, when my friend Susan's book gets published because that is going to be all about Joy Tribes and it's going to be fun. So anyway, I've added a few little photos, but you know what I realized is the more I add to my calendar, the more attached I get to it. So like this first month when I hardly have any, my cats are gonna fight over here. Not fight, but they're playing. Hopefully we won't hear them. Um, <clears throat> the more I add to it, the more I, I guess the more valuable it becomes to me. So in the first month, I'm not really that attached to my calendar, but the more I put in here, the more I really enjoy it. So. That's my calendar, and I have finishes today. I have two new patterns to show you. I have an antique sampler frame that I just got back from the framer, and I have a giveaway, and we're gonna talk about color again, which I love talking about color. We're gonna talk about color, warm and cool colors. I have um, a new kind of reference tool for you to help you, and then also fabrics. In colors so let's jump in first of all um, those primrose cottage gals came out with the Valentine's Day Quaker which is just beautiful and I stitched it with a few more colors added in which I started with the um, autumn one just added a few colors and then I kind of got myself in the habit of doing that so I will try to remember to put this the colors below, but if I forget, check my Instagram. Um, so here's the pattern and here's the colors. And I just added a few more pinks. I added a hot pink, a red, a light pink and a darker pink, I think they're four. Beautiful either way. Beautiful as a single. I brought the winter one, which I've already shown you, but just as another example of <clears throat> here was their winter Quaker, and here's the one I did. And ready for market pre-orders is the um, let's see, Fourth of July. Do they call it the Fourth of July Quaker? Anyway, they did it in color, so I'm stitching it exactly like they did it because it's beautiful. And then also, they just announced they have the Spring Quaker coming out, which I'll pick up at market um, in a couple of weeks when I go. So that'll be fun. <clears throat> so that was my first finish was the Valentine Quaker. And then I did, I think I talked to you last time about how I'm going to try and do 
12 ornaments in 24. I think that's the hashtag, 12 ornaments in 24. Caroling 55 is spot, not sponsoring, but kind of um, encouraging people to do that because she has the most incredible ornaments on her trees and on her stair railings and it's just so inspiring. So I did my first one. This was, I think, the 1984 Prairie Schooler Santa. And I swapped out the skin tone. So I, I used 945 for the skin skin tone. And I used 3865 for the white. And I used 498 for the red. And uh, Weeks Cocoa, 40 count. So they're going to be small. And I know Carol um, suggests that you finish them as you go along. I think I'm going to do three like finish every three months I think I'll finish them into ornaments I haven't made ornaments before so I gotta watch Vanna if you ever need to know how to finish anything watch Vanna the twisted stitcher she has videos free videos that she shares out of the goodness of her heart and she's just the best so she has some great tips and tricks and so before I do my ornament finishing I will be watching Vanna's video on that which I'm sure she has. So anyway, January's finished. February, I'm going to do another one of these. I'm going to do preschoolers all, all year. I think I've started collecting Santas now, but I'm going to do that for my winter cross stitch camp. And I don't know if you are on Instagram or Facebook or if you've seen people posting, but winter cross stitch camp is something I started three, I think this is our third February to have it. And um, it's just a one month challenge. It's free to join. Just jump in. The challenge is to use, to stitch a pattern that has an animal in it and birds. Mine has birds in it that I'm going to do next time. And so be sure and check out floss tube number 47 because that gives you the details of when a cross stitch can. But I would love for you to join us if you'd like to. I haven't even started mine yet, so you're not too late if you haven't started. Okay, the next one is my also every month. See, I've got myself into two things that I'm committed to stitching every month. I'm not sure how I'm going to like that, but so far I've liked what I'm stitching. So I'm doing A Year of Silhouettes by Joan Elliott. She has beautiful patterns. I have more that I'll show you at the Little Shop Talk at the end. Um, but each month I'm doing a different square and I decided to do these with a little bit of color in each square. Um, just like one or two things in each square that I can add a pop of color to. And in some of hers she does that. Like her Halloween one is really cool. It's all black. Done all black but then pops of yellow. So here is my uh, February. Nope. Yeah, February square January and February and I started in on the alphabet down below the thing about this is I have trouble stopping like I just want to keep working on it I can't wait to get to the next one which is uh, flying a kite March flying a kite so I think I'm going to color the flying the kite and maybe their hats and in the February one, I just colored the birds and their little beaks. I don't know if you can see that. January, I did their scarves and the moon. And then in the ABCs, I colored the roof on the house. This is kind of fun. And I think when it's done, it's going to be stunning. I'm doing this on 25 count Silver Moon or Pewter. Oh, you know, I'm bad at this. All right. and even though I write it down on my calendar, I'm bad. Okay, where's my calendar? I can tell you what it is. That's what this is for, to be able to look it up and tell you. It is not in here because I put it in December of last year. It's 25 count, one over one on Pewter or Silver Moon. Sorry, I will try to get better at that. Anyway, that's that. I hope to finish my March square 
and the ABCs before I plus two begin. We'll see how I do. And then I asked you for your advice last time because I was working on Satsuma Streets Alpine and I wasn't sure if I wanted to do the diagonals here, which makes it a little different to frame. If you want to frame it, I do like how they finished that. Um, and then I didn't know, should I leave off the deer and just square it up? And it was almost unanimous, do not leave off the deer. And I agree with that because I really like that deer. So I finished it just as it is. So this is 40 count Weeks Dye Works. Not cocoa, but something close to cocoa. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm sorry. I, I will be better. Anyway, it was a fun stitch. I love the colors in here. And I haven't decided how I'm going to finish it yet. It's small, so it's it wouldn't be... Um, it might be kind of fun to finish it like this as a wall hanging. I think they did theirs on 14 count. So theirs is a lot bigger. But, you know, I like to go smaller just for space. I don't have room for 14 count big pictures. So haven't decided how I'm going to finish it. We'll see. Thinking about it. All right, and then this was another one I showed you that I wanted to finish. So I had the house and um, the pretty basket of flowers on the top. And I went back and forth when I started this one because I thought maybe I wanted to brighten up the flowers, you know, make them more reds like poinsettias. But these are pomegranates. Anyway, I ended up doing just what the pattern called for and had a finish and oh, I love how this turned out. The colors are just so beautiful on this. What I did end up doing, this is also on 40 count and this is on Weeks Cocoa. I'm not even going to tell you because I don't know. It could be up in the app. I think it was the called for. Hang on. I never use the called for because I never have the called for. It's up in the attic by Fox and Rabbit. That's what this is. 40 count instead of 36 count, which is the called for. Um, so on the bottom, I was feeling like my these two colors weren't different enough. And then I read the directions and it said, do your stitching in one strand on 36 count, but do two strands of the white. Well, I didn't read the directions before I had stitched the white. So I stitched the white in the regular one strand, which you wouldn't be able to really stitch two strands on 40 count anyway. But then I was worried that it wasn't going to show up in that snow on the bottom. So what I did was I did the tenth stitch and the tenth stitch is just doing half of your cross. So instead of doing for your X, you just do this. And technically, I think you're supposed to, when you do the tenth stitch, do the top stitch. So if your top stitch is goes this way, then your tenth stitch should be this. And I did not do that because I wasn't thinking, but I think it looks okay. So I'm gonna hold it up closer so you can see. And you really can't even tell that's a tenth stitch, right? You really can't tell that it is just half, but it helped the snowflakes to show up better. So there you go. If you have something that you feel like it's not showing up, of course change the thread out. That, that would be an easy fix too, but um, also keep in mind you can just do a half stitch and it will turn out a little bit lighter. And from this distance you just you can't tell that I only did half stitches. Well you really can't tell unless you get really really up close. And of course that took half the time to stitch because I was only doing half stitches. So that was an extra bonus. Okay, um, then my next finishes were, were my two new patterns that I have. They're up at the shop now. So the first one is a little guy and it's for Easter. He is risen.
which I have a lot of, uh, no, I don't have a lot of. I have plans to do a lot of fun Easter things to put on display, but I wanted a He Is Risen, and I did it a He Is Risen in a, it's more in a grapevine wreath kind of thing from Cross-Eyed Cricket years ago. Um, so I'm glad to have a second one. So here's the pattern. It only takes four threads and it is in color. So that's the first one. He has risen. And then I did another words for home and this one is bloom. So I have words for home. I have Christmas the joy one, I have the fall harvest one, and this one is bloom, and I'll show you those. So when I do words for home, I do the word, I do a stack, and I do a little teeny tiny mini town. So here is bloom, and I don't usually stitch with pastel colors, so that was kind of fun. So there's bloom. And then I took the eggs and made an egg stack. And the theory with this is you get three pillows that go together so it's easy to do a little display, a little bowl display. And then here's the little town. And I love these little skinny pillows. They're hard to hold when you want to hold them up, but I do like them. So then, and I did this on 36 count white. So then they all go together in your display on a shelf or whatever. I um, used this Baker's Twine that we have in the shop to put around the edges. I, I like the chenille and I like the Baker's Twine um, best. Probably I use those two the most, but I just like how it covers up your stitch line there. And when I stitch pillows, I tried, I tried doing some where you stitch all the way around and then you cut a slit in the back and you fill it in the back and then you put a little heart or a little some kind of felt over the top and stitch it down and I could never get it as full as I wanted it and I fill my um, pillows with crushed walnut shells which is also lizard litter so I never got it as, as full and as tight as I wanted it so now what I do is I just leave an opening at the bottom, fill it all, I can fill it really full, and then I stitch it closed, and bef right before I'm ready to do the last couple stitches, I put a little more in, and watch Fana's tutorial because she tells you how to, you know, really take a, a stick, like a stuffing stick, and really punch it down into the corners and stir it up, and that what that does is it helps it to settle, so it helps you to get a fuller, fill if you like that kind of thing which I do so but what I like about the um, twine then is that just covers up you know the little place where I had to stitch it closed and I just think it kind of puts a frame around it you know a little bit so so that is bloom bloom to go with his risen both aspects of Easter covered. All right. Next, I want to show you, and I'm really excited about this. So my favorite sampler that I've stitched is the Smith Sampler by the Scarlet House. And so I brought it. It hangs behind the counter at the shop. What I love about this sampler is the border. Well, I really like the symmetry, but I also love the border. Look at the border. It's just, it's not flowery. It's not, it's just, I like the triangles the, and the way the color is. I'm trying to not get a glare. So this is my favorite sampler that I've stitched. I had fun stitching it. I was sad when it was done, which usually I'm just excited when something's done. And this one I was sad because I, I was sad to not be working on it anymore. The only thing I changed in here was on this basket um, in the pattern, it's white and it has the, the name Smith, thus the Smith sampler. And so I 
since that name didn't have meaning, I took that out and just mimicked the triangles on the corners or on the borders for there. Now here's a little be careful tip if you stitch the Smith sampler, it's different right here in the middle. So I was stitching along, I stitched, you know, you kind of get in your mind of what the count is and you stitch and I got to this end and it didn't meet up. Thankfully, I just had to back, you know, take out back to here. So if you're doing it, just watch your counts on the top. But after I got done with this, I know that Tanya at the Scarlet House sells some of her older antiques once she's charted them. Not all of them, because, you know, some of them she just loves and wants to keep, but some of them she knows she's probably not going to frame. And so I, um, she came to visit the shop last summer and we did a meet and greet. And when we were talking, I said, hey, you wouldn't by any chance want to sell the Smith sampler. I knew she hadn't framed it yet because she had brought it to summer school the year before so I could see it and she did so I took it to summer school at the attic this past August um, to have Sandy who is um, so good at framing there uh, frame it for me I was really nervous about getting an antique sampler framed because I couldn't imagine how they would do that you know the edges which you'll see in a minute are kind of um, ratty and you know there's holes usually in an old sampler a lot of times and so what they do is they find a piece of linen that kind of matches your antique so that if there's holes through it that shows through and then they stitch the sampler itself onto this piece of linen and then frame it so I'm going to show you the frame <coughs> excuse me so here is the frame. It's not pretty. So it has museum glass. And I'll bring it up a little closer so you can maybe see just how they did the edges. And then let me hold up both at the same time. I do not get music glass on mine, my samplers, but of course I wanted to for the antique, so and you can compare. I love looking at the original and the design that came from it. What do you think? Fun? It sure brightens up, you know, when you do the actual pattern itself. But so fun to look at, to look closely at an antique sampler and really see how that girl stitched and the decision she made. And this particular gal was so good about stitching symmetrically. You know, some antique samplers are really wonky like you know it looks like it should match but it doesn't necessarily match and I wish I knew more about this Smith girl as it turns out I have Smith people in my family generations back so that kind of makes it even more special anyway I just wanted to share that with you and I'm gonna put it up at the shop right next to this one which I think will be fun. Okay, next, let's talk about, let's talk about this. So, if you were stitching in the 80s, 90s, I'm not sure when this came about, do you remember when Just Cross Stitch Magazine came out? I was so excited to have a magazine on cross stitching and I, oh, I collected all the issues. I mean, I, I subscribed forever. And then when we moved here to Colorado in 2011, I went through all my cross stitch stuff and I had not stitched in 10 years at that point. And I, I went through all those old magazines and if there was something I thought I would stitch in it, I saved it. Otherwise I sold all of them at a garage sale. Of course I could just kick myself now because I would love looking back on all of those issues, but you can still subscribe and you can of course still get it at the bookstores. 
So I have this issue and I just wanted to tell you because they have a stitch along going on and it's all year and it is a Carolyn Manning design. And you know I did a Carolyn Manning, she's the one that does all the beautiful quilt patterns that you can stitch. And I did one of her um, patterns last year for summer camp, summer stitch camp. So this is what it's going to look like. And I just thought you guys would want to see it. This is called Hummingbird Garden. Did you know a group of hummingbirds is called a charm? That's just charming. Charm. So each, let's see, each quarter you will get another section of three. And then they also have I'll link to this um, below, but they also have their, their website. They have a website, Annie's, I think it's Annie's something, but I'll link to it. And they are selling kits with the floss, and it's Sullivan floss, which I've never stitched with before, and with the fabric. What is that fabric? I don't know if it says. Let me see. It looks like a Jobelin or something. Oh, it's nice. It's white. So that's what it's going to look like when it's done. And you can get the kit, and I will link to that below. And then you just collect it each time. And that's not like that's not too much to stitch in a quarter, I don't think. I think that's very doable. But I was flipping through here, and I noticed that my friend Ray from Red Barn Sampler has a really cute little sampler pattern in here. Now, if you're new to samplers, this would be a great one to start because it's not overly big. Very doable. Very cute, right? And then I also really like this one, which is called Pieces of History. And I thought, how fun would that be to do? Um, so they took a pillow and, well, I'll show you. Okay, I'll just show you. They took a pillow and then they have patterns, the patterns for these different motifs. And then I'm sure it was nun stitch. No, it wasn't nun stitch. It's just a regular, what is that called? Anyway, you stitch each of the pieces or pieces that are meaningful to you, add them to your pillow. You can add in um, buttons and charms and all kinds of things and just kind of make a really unique little pillow. So now there's some fun things in here. There's a lot more, that's cute. Who went, who's that one by? I'm going to put my glasses on because I don't want to show you without telling you. Oh, Erin Elizabeth. Oh, nice to see what Erin Elizabeth looks like. Erin Elizabeth, you're young. You have the cutest designs. And look, Hello Spring. I love her designs. So, a lot of cute patterns in this issue. Both more contemporary and more, um, you know, old, nostalgic. So you might want to pick this up. Oh, that's cute. Hang on. Now I lost it. Tulip Trio. Isn't that cute? Who's that by? Tracy Richards of Wrought Iron Stitching. Very cute. So check for this on your in your bookstores, or um, you can also get it digitally. Digitally. Um, by going to their website. So yeah, really fun. And if you decide to join in on the stitch along, let me know. I may, I may be stitching this. I think it's a really pretty spring and summer piece. And I don't know, I tend to stitch a lot of fall and winter pieces. And then spring comes and I'm trying to figure out what else I can do for, you know, putting things up and decorating. So this is really a pretty one for spring and summer decorating. All right, then another thing that we are um, involved with this year is the Homespun group on Facebook. It's a big group, 15,000 members. It's free to join. Um, I will link to that below. Please uh, hop over there and join. But Julie, who runs that group, has exclusives from time to time where it's just available to the members of that group. Again, it doesn't cost anything to join in. It's really fun. It's a fun group because you can see all different kinds of people share things they're working on and it's just a, it's just a great group to be a part of. And so we were um, 
really honored to be one of the shops that is sharing that is has available this kit. Now this is, they call it the BAP for a big awesome project and Julie started talking about doing a BAP last fall. I think she asked the group if they'd be interested in doing a big piece because a lot of her exclusives are not as big and a lot of people said yes let's do a really big a BAP project. So we're the shop in the United States that is selling the kits for the BAP and then um, Stitcher's Merchant in uh, Australia, my friend Tam owns that store and she is selling them for Australia, New Zealand because you know the price of shipping is just so crazy. So Vicki at Needlework Press um, pulled out this beautiful sampler. She has so many samplers. Um, I think I read somewhere or did she tell me her parents used to collect antique samplers so she that's why she always has such incredible reproductions. So the reproduction for the BAP was Charlotte Warrington 1838. And so here is the pattern. I am not sure I've ever seen a sampler that has so many things going on. You've got Adam and Eve. You've got more modern day, not modern day in our day, but more modern than Adam and Eve. Couple up here. You've got all these sheep going on in the bottom. And this fabulous house which looks like a castle to me and it's just a really cool pattern and so you could stitch it the whole thing as it is and there's going to be a stitch along going on I think they're going to break it up into two years so um, if you go in that group Olive Green is going to work on that for you and she's going to lead the charge and so she will be in charge of dividing up all of these pieces into 24 little segments so all you have to do is you know your little segment each month and in two years you'll have it done which is a, a nice way to do it a little bit of accountability and so we offered the kit in um, either MPI silks or uh, Weeks Dye Works or DMC and we are completely out of the DMC we have more on order but let me just get these out so I can show you some of the colors and it's multiple skeins of a lot of these colors as you'll see 37 skeins of floss and then we had Patty from Mason Linens dye the fabrics and we're totally out of the linen. So here, this is the 18 count that I brought to show you. We have more in order. We have more DMC in order. The way this exclusive works is um, you pre-order it. The stores have stocked up before it's even announced. But it's technically considered a pre-order because we've stocked up. We send out all the kits that we've made ahead of time to the people as they order. So some people get their ship notice like that day or the next day. Some people then have to wait until we can get resupplies in. We've about used up all the DMC available in some of these colors in the United States. So we're waiting on more shipments. And same with the fabric. So Patty dyed more fabric. She's got more fabric shipping to me next week. And if you haven't used Mason Linens, you are in for a treat because she just does a beautiful job of the dyeing. So here's the, I'm going to show you the back. What I love about her linen is she she doesn't do um, big splotches and I'm just not a big splotch kind of a person for working on linens but there's just a subtlety to this that is just absolutely gorgeous. So that is we're fortunate to have Mason linens in this kit and the kit in Australia has fox and rabbit because it just doesn't make sense for them to order and pay shipping to send fabric all the way over there. So they've got fox and rabbit, which is also gorgeous linen. So those are the kits. And I did not bring the little tray. It also includes a little tray um, that snaps up. So it goes flat, but you can snap up the corners and you can keep your scissors and your floss and your tools in there. And so the kit also includes that tray 
And what Kathy did, who made our trays, is she took um, the pattern from the border and one of the motifs on the inside and engraved that on the tray. So it's very cool. But if you would like the links for that, go to the link of the Facebook group in my notes below, and there you'll find the link to get back to uh, our, our listing of it on our shop. That's how that works. You can only get the kit if you're a member of that group. And it's just one of the exclusives that Julie does. And she's got another one going on right now from Stacy Nash. So you might want to check that one out too. So anyway, we've had fun working on that kit. Um, we were glad to be able to work with everybody. And um, so I hope you enjoy that. All right, now let's talk about, okay, first I'm going to do my three things and then we're going to talk color. So my three things this time, one of them is Photon. And this is something that I got from my friends last weekend for my birthday. And it is, I've never seen anything like it. So it comes with a packet of wicks, which are not in here. I have the wicks in the kitchen. And then it's full of, I don't know if you can see that. I don't want to spill it full of powdered wax. So what you do is you put the wax in a container like this and you fill it up with, you know, the powder and then you stick a wick in and it comes with like 30 wicks in here and then you light it and it, it of course glows, it burns. And then when you're done and you blow it out, you just pick this part of it up, throw this away, and the rest is ready for your next candle. Isn't that cool? Now the other cool thing about this is it's so lightweight that you can put it in water. So you can get like a tall cylinder glass. You can tuck um, a flower. They show that on their Instagram. You can put a flower in, submerge a flower. Somehow you'd have to tack it down to the bottom, but okay, submerge a flower. Pour the wax, the little, these guys, the little powdered wax pellets. It feels like sand. Pour that on top. It floats, stick the wick in, and then have a candle burning. And it's just like really impressive, very cool. You could put shells in the bottom, you could put whatever, but it's really neat that it floats on water. So I'm gonna try that next time. So I linked to this below. Again, it's called Photon really fun thing to play with. The next one is, um, and my friend Carolyn, who also works at the shop, gave me this for Christmas and I just love it. I think this is from the Old Needle Shop. I couldn't find exactly, but the Old Needle Shop has these sets. So, and Carolyn told me, I just, I favorited the shop and now I can't find what it was. But anyway, it's a little stitching tray, perfect size. Again, great for your scissors, great for your extra needles. So it came with a little needle book to match the fabrics, which are Blackbird fabrics, and you know, a little tie. So you open this and keep your extra needles in there. And then it came with a little strawberry. It's cute, I like that ribbon on top. And so then you have a whole set to keep on your table next to your stitching chair. And when I was looking last night, the old needle book, I will link to her below. Um, she has all different colors, all different fabrics, all different types of things. So check her out. A lot of fun things there. And then the third thing, you know, I always try and give you it. And then I got little pieces of wax on the table. Uh, I always try and give you an Instagram account to check out. So this one is Reb, R-E-B-3, the number three. D, Reb3D on Instagram. I will link to them below. It almost reminds me of Mousetrap, but musical. I know, you just have to check it out because it's hard to explain, but they do these graphics where they have the ball drop and the ball dings against different things, but it plays different tunes. So, Okay, just check it out. I don't know how to explain it better. I wish I could insert a little something here for you to see. It's just fun. And I think if you've got kids or grandkids, they would have fun watching this. So the ball goes around and it makes all these dings and it 
you know, goes in time with the music and it looks like the ball is playing all the different things for the music and just, just very creative. So Reb3D on Instagram, I will link to them below. And there's that. All right, let's talk color. I love talking about color. I did, if you didn't see my um, floss tube number 44, that's where I first start talking about color um, and just the warms and cools of color. Now, I, uh, I got my color training from House of Color. It is a, they're a color analysis company out of the UK. They have consultants in the United States. I loved doing color on people. I, I didn't have the time that I wanted, and so I always think maybe I'll go back to it when I retire, but I love doing color. Anyway, that's where I learned all that I know about warm and cool colors. Still a lot to learn, but the more you think in terms of warm and cool and the more you recognize those, um, the easier it becomes. So when I was going through color training, which is very intensive, I would just practice like walking down the street. That's a warm color. That's a cool color. Okay, that's warm. Um, so I just started trying to identify them. When I started stitching, I there were some patterns that just I liked the pattern and I liked most of the colors, but then I'd start stitching and I'd just get bored or I don't know. There was just something missing. So I started thinking in terms of, okay, is it because it's warm colors and I'm a cool color person? Is it because it's cool colors, but there's a you know a couple warms thrown in? So I started trying to identify what makes me like this or not like this and how can I change that? And so we talked about that in my number 44 floss tube. And then I promised you that I would come back and do sets of DMC for you, warm and cool, and also talk about fabrics. But we're also gonna talk about patterns too, because I just want you to get used to, if you're interested in it, you know. And some, some people just like stitching the way it's called for, and that's totally great. Because you know the the designers are wonderful, have a wonderful eye with color, so I'm not suggesting that you need to change things. But if you're stitching something and you think there's just something missing, there's it needs something. Maybe it needs a pop. Maybe you're stitching warm colors and you need to put a pop of cool in there. Or maybe you're stitching cool colors on a warm fabric and it would look different with cool colors on a cool fabric, or vice versa. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So first of all. I promised you guys that I would come up with a list of DMC colors, so that's what I did. I took the color correcting lights, which I have here when I um, floss tube, took them into the shop, set them up so we've got the actual colors, um, which is important. And so I did up, and this is not a fancy list, but you can download it from our website. It's a free, it's under the free patterns, but here's the list of the DMC. Um, warm and cool. So if you have these at home and you want to pull them together, I also have some sets of them in the shop. If you don't want to have to pull them together and you just want to buy them from us. So here is warms and cools. Now when you get them, they're going to, hang on. When you get them, they come like this. And what I recommend is don't use these. Like just keep them in the clear plastic and you can use them as this, as a reference tool. So these are not um, threads that you're gonna stitch from, you're gonna use them as a reference tool. Now, can you get a piece of white fabric and stitch them up on the fabric and use that as your reference tool? Of course you can do that. But if you're gonna do that, make sure you're making them as wide and long as a floss, because if you just do little bitties, you're not, you're not gonna get that overall effect when you're holding up different flosses and trying to figure out if it's warm or cool. So certainly you can do that, but make sure it's big enough so that you're gonna be able to tell. So um, Paul put this together for me just for our demo today, but I wanted to just show you how this works. So when I first talked color, a couple people said, well, I thought blues and greens are cool and oranges and reds and yellows are warm. Yes, in general, but you also have warm blues and cool blues, warm greens and cool greens, um, warm reds and cool reds. So yes, in general, that is true, but within the spectrum, 
and I we try to put them together there. So we've got warm greens here and cool greens here, and you can see the difference in those two. Warm colors have like a touch of um, yellow or a touch of cream added to them. Cool colors are more have a blue undertone, cooler uh, a cooler bite to them. So here, warm blues, cool blues. Warm purples, cool purples. So you can just see how it matches the pinks and the corals and the yellows. There really are no cool um, yellows. The only cool yellow is a, like an ice lemon and it's really just the iciest of yellows. It's really hard to find, but it's in the winter palette. But for this, I didn't find the ice yellow in the DMCs, so I left it out. So we've got warm browns, we've got cool browns, we've got warm gray, cool gray. So I hope this is a, a handy tool for you, and I'm going to show you how, how to use it. So if you, if you search for um, color sets in the search box on our website, you'll find these guys. If we run out, we'll get more. Um, I've got a bunch of them, but again, you, you can also just download the free list if you prefer to do that. So this is how you use it. Let's say you're, you're stitching something and I have a lot of patterns I'm going to show you as an example so you can kind of um, start seeing cools and warms. But let's just say you need to find uh, a palette of, you want to change it to something cooler because you want cooler tones. So I brought samples of threads and I'm going to show you how you can lay them on top of, let me get this organized, lay them on top of these colors and you'll see if it goes. All right, so if I lay this, let me hang on. Okay, this is um, Bing Cherry, Classic Color Works. If I lay this on top of the warm colors, it does not mesh with that. It does not look like it fits within that color palette. It just looks off. If I layer it over here, you can see, even though I don't have this exact color over here, you can tell that it's a cool color because it plays well with these colors. This does not look good. This looks good, so it's a cool. Now let's take this color. This is red currant. All right. If I put it over here, it does not play well with the cool colors. But if I put it over here, it does look nice with the warm colors. This is a warmer red. All right. Let's do this one. This is licorice. Licorice red. Does not play well with these colors. Looks much better with the cool colors, all right? Ruby Slippers does not play well with cool, but it looks right at home with the warm colors. So that's how you use this tool. If you're stitching something warm, and we talked about this on Floss Tube 44, if you're stitching something warm and you want a cool pop of color, because sometimes if you use a color that doesn't play well, it is it almost becomes the focus of the piece in a really cool way. So this allows you, if you think it just needs a little something more, I need to find a pop color, it allows you to identify you know, which of those is which. So here's a purple, does not play well with these purples, these colors, it does look well, play well with these colors. All right, here's, a, that was, Plum Paisley. And then this one is Sugar Plum, all right? Does not play well with the cools. Right at home with the warms. Isn't this fun? I love color. All right, this one. It's a brown, which you typically think of as warm, but it, this brown doesn't look great with the warm colors because it is a cool brown. So it looks better with those colors. This one, cayenne, which is a red-brown, looks really nice with the warm colors, looks off with the cool colors. I've got a few more. All right, let's go to whites. So this white 
does not look good with the warm colors, does it? It really stands out. But when you put it over here in the cool colors, it looks right at home. I know I'm not looking at you because I'm looking at the mirror to see what I'm doing. All right, that white was uh, bamboo. And this white, 12 grain, looks right at home with the warm colors. Because it and does not look good over here with the cool colors because if you look at it you can tell I don't know if you can tell on your screen but you can tell that one this one has a little bit of yellow tone to it a little bit of cream whereas this one is that icy white stark white and you can see the difference here but you can also see the difference when you're using them on your reference skeins to see how they play okay let's look at pinks this pink Looks right at home with the cool colors. Dissonance does not does not go with the warm colors. This pink does look nice with the warm colors. Doesn't look nice with the cool colors. So you can see, even though I haven't like categorized all 600 and whatever colors of DMC into warm and cool, just by having a reference set, you can tell, you can hold up any DMC floss, any silks, any hand dyes and see, does it play well with that or does it look off? And that's how you tell if it's warm or cool. So this one doesn't look good with the warm colors, looks right at home with the cool colors. That was Betsy Bluebell. Betsy Bluebell? I should have my glasses on. I'm going to put my glasses on. And then this, Plymouth, okay, sorry, I'm just going to do this. That was Betty Bluebell. This is Mermaid's Fin. So Mermaid's Fin looks not great with the cool colors, right at home with the warm colors. All right, spinach does not look good with warm, does look great with cool. Mossy doesn't look great with cool, but looks right at home with the warm. Cauldron doesn't match the warm, fits right in with the cool. Baking tin doesn't fit with the cool, looks right at home with the warm. So that's how you use this, the, this tool or these packs and again, you can just leave them just like they are right here in the plastic. You don't have to take them out. And just lay your lay your colors right on top of here to see if they play well together or not. So you don't have to have them strung out like I do, but that was helpful for my floss tube talk here. All right, so that's how you use this. Now let's look at some patterns so we can talk about what you're seeing in the pattern so you can kind of get used to identifying that for yourself. So here I brought a couple of finishes home and I'm just giving you different examples so you can get used to seeing because some of you might be thinking well I don't think I'd ever want to mix warm and cool because they don't play well together but again it can really um, add a pop or an interest. So this particular pattern, and this comes from the book Simone Smalls, but this one, I picked my own colors for that, and I don't remember what the colors were, but I picked a cool red and a warm teal. So this is half and half, warms and cools. And I like the way it turned out. Here's another one. These are two of my um, own designs, and I picked two warm colors and two cool colors so again, half and half, half warm, half cool. Sometimes it helps each other pop. The warm help the cool pop and the cool help the warm pop. So those are just some finished examples that I pulled to bring to show you. And let's see. Like, let's go back to the finishes I showed you. This one, you look at that and it's warm colors, but the evergreen trees are cool. So they really kind of stand out, don't they? Let's see this one. This is warm colors. I would say the lake colors and the surrounding border are cool colors. So the cool border kind of makes the warm colors pull forward on that. Let's see. This is going to be 
cool colors except for the moon. Of course, it's going to be a warm. So now let's look at some of the, and I really just picked bigger patterns to bring to you to show. I'm going to put my glasses on because I want to be able to point out all the things. So these are warm stitches, warm patterns on cool fabrics. All right. So this one, all those are warm colors except for the black cat. Black is always a cool color, but it's on a cool background. So you see how the warm colors pull forward and pop on that. Here's another one, warm colors on a cool background, and those are all warm colors on the cool black background. But they really pop, don't they? So sometimes you're going to use a warm fabric, and I'm going to show you fabric examples. You're going to use a warm fabric with cool colors to bring them forward, to bring the stitching forward. Sometimes you will use cool colors on cool fabrics or warm colors on warm fabrics to just make it harmonious, just make it really blend. So it's just a different look. One's not better than the other, it's just different. Here are warm colors on a very cool white. Here are also, okay, now this is a good example because you look at this and you say, well, those are blues and greens. Isn't that cool? These are warm blues and greens, except for possibly one, which I'll show you. Mostly warm blues and greens on a cool background. But don't you look at that and think, oh, that's a, a cool colored pattern. But when you start matching it with your these, you can see it, it matches with these, not these except for the Kelly green in there, and I would have to pull the actual color, um, and maybe the darkest sapphire blue would be a cool, but mostly warms in that one from the photo. Maybe when you pull the colors, they're different. Okay, this one is warm colors on a cool background, except for... Hmm? No, I would say those are all warm colors. Yeah, warm colors on a cool background. I love this one. I want to stitch this one sometime. Cat and the flowers. This is warm colors on a cool background. Except for the black pop at the bottom, the little black triangles. That's a cool. Her stockings are so cute. I know we're not talking patterns, but this is so dang cute. All right, this is warm colors, cool background. Look at the eyelashes on that cute deer. This one is interesting. It is <clears throat> mostly warm colors, but you've got a sapphire blue in the town below and the red of the Santa well, I'd have to see that in person. It might be a cool, might be a warm. You know how when you take pictures, it looks a little different. So we'd have to pull the actual colors. I'm hooking myself on these pins. All right, this is mostly warm colors on a cool background, except for the blue mountains at the bottom. The darker of the blue is a, is a cool. <clears throat> Warm colors, warm background. Hmm, this is in the wrong order, but this is warm on warm, so now you can see what warm on warm looks like. That red is kind of tending a little bit towards the cool. All right, this is warm colors on cool background. Here's another one. All warm colors, cool background. And again, I think when you mix your fabric and your threads like that, warm on cool, cool on warm, it really helps the stitching pop. 
but sometimes you don't want the stitching to necessarily pop. You want it to just look cohesive. So this is warm colors on cool background. Yeah. And again, you might pull the color, the actual colors and think when you get the actual floss in your hand, you might look at that because that red could be a cool color. In the picture, it looks warm, but when once you pull the DMC, you can compare it to your reference sets and see if it is or isn't. Not that it matters, but just, you know, as you go along. Warm colors, warm colors on a cool background, and I would say the fuchsia pink is a cool, but the rest I would call warm. <clears throat> All right, now here are a few cool colors on cool backgrounds. Cool colors on cool backgrounds. So this is a more of a harmonious, everything goes together. Cool colors, cool background. I should compare that to this one so you can see the difference between warm blues and greens, cool blues and greens. This one is cool colors on a cool background, except for the pomegranates, which is a warm red. So you can see how that adds a little bit of pop because it's a little different red. All right, here's cool colors on warm backgrounds. So cool colors popping off of a warm background. Country Mocha is the fabric. Definitely a warm. Here is cool colors, except for the orange in there, on a warm background. The orange in there would of course be a warm. All right, here's warm colors, warm background. Warm colors, warm background. Another one. Warm colors, except for the darkest of browns, and that's going to be cool, but basically warm colors, warm background. Warm colors, warm background. I don't really see any cool colors in that one, so warm on warm. This one also, her dress looks like a cool brown, but otherwise warm on warm. This one is warm on warm, but the grays in the trunk, the dark gray is a cool. So that's got a cool pop and is there black and the blacks are cools. I love this one. I want to do that one. This one is warm on warm except for the black of the buzzy bees and probably the darkest brown in the middle of the flowers, but otherwise warm on warm. And again, you can see how a pop, just one or two colors in the other spectrum can add a little bit of pop, a little bit of fun to your pattern. Okay, warm colors on warm, and those are the, one of the few, couple of the darker fuchsias may tend into the cool category. Again, you'd have to pull the actual threads, but that's what I'm guessing on this one. Otherwise, warm on warm. All right now, I brought a few that are just more mixed. So let's look at a few of those. So this one, this one is on cool fabric. And you've got cool, I'm going to show you in just a second, but i got to figure out what I want to tell you. You've got cool colors going on, except you've got a warm pink, a warm apple green, and a warm teal. So it's a pretty good mix of warms and cools on there. Do you like that? Do you like how that looks? Do you like that mix? Just something to think about. Because as you're trying to figure out, well, I don't know, 
Am I going to do a pop-up color? Am I going to try and switch some out? Am I going to think through that? Maybe you don't like the look of, so that's why I'm trying to show you a lot of different patterns because you'll look, maybe you'll look through these and think, oh, I do like the warm colors better. And I just like all warm. Or maybe you're looking thinking, I like the warm, but it's fun to have a little bit of pop of a cool or vice versa. So that's the benefit of looking through some of these together. All right, this one is cool. The cool is the darkest evergreen, but the rest is warm, on warm. Again, that red might be like the border red to me looks like a cool red, whereas the truck looks like warm red. But pull your threads and take a look. Um, this one is a good mix because the roof, the blacks are of course cool. The brown tree, I think, no, that's a warm. So a lot of black in there, and of course the white is cool because it's a, it's a stark white, but the rest is all warm. <coughs> All right, this one, warm, good warm border, warm pumpkins, warm stuff out of the bubbly pot, but the purple and the black are cool. So it's a mix. This one has cool colors on a warm background with a warm pot. And then I think they also, I can see they also use this yellow green pot color kind of mixed in too. All right, this one is warm on warm, except the grass is cool and the black parts. This is interesting to me because it's a very unusual look. It's a, I don't know. It's got a lot of warm, but then such cool grass. Interesting. This is warm on cool, except for the reds. The reds are cool. I love the colors in this one. This is another one I've always wanted to do. This is warm colors on a cool fabric, except for the black, which is cool. So that's a good mix. And then the last one, another one that I think would be fun to do. This is warm, mostly warm. The dark red is a cool, and there's a dark evergreen in the grass that's cool, but it's a mix because some of the grass is also warm. So that's interesting, huh? Anyway, just a little more color information for you. <clears throat> Now let's look at some of the colors of fabric. So I'm going to show you warm colors, keeping my glasses on so I can read and tell you what it is. Show you warm colors first. I have one fabric that is an interesting mix of warm and cool, and then I'll show you cool colors. There's more warm colors than cool colors in the fabric world. So this is Winter Moon. It's a lovely warm cream color. This is Parchment. Fiber on a Whims parchment. We've got warm tones of greens in there and tans. Fiber on a whim cypress. Now, some of the cypress, I bet, could tend a little towards the cool side, but this one, you can see the warm yellow, more yellow undertones in. This is, um, these, let's see, lightly salted, not roasted, warm. Lagoon, warm teal. Summer tacky, warm. Lap and Loops Crypt Cloth, warm. After I show you both warms and cools, I'll hold a se selection of them next to each other. Antique White, warm. Again, antique white compared to white white 
This has a little bit of cream, a little bit of yellow to it. Uh, Weeks Dye Works parchment. I love that. Warm. Fox and Rabbit ballet slippers. Warm. Weeks Dye Works Havana. Another one I love. Warm. But can't you just see a pop of cool on there. So you can take your cool colors and say, would I like that? I think it would look stunning. But also, would I like this? Also stunning. Just a different look. All right. Cream. I already showed you cream. Uh, espresso. Fiber on a whim. Cafe au lait. One of my favorite colors. All right, so those are warm examples. Now, look at this Haunted, which I think is so cool by Seraphim. So the green, the lighter color is warm, and the darkest of grays is a cool, is a cooler gray. It's going to tend towards looking a little warm because it's surrounded by so much yarn. But if you isolate that gray, it is more of a blue gray. So that is a really interesting mix. All right, now let's look at cool colors. Night Sky by Five Barn Whim. Cool. Platinum is a good cool. Chosen Forbidden Fiber. Gray Mini Dots. Cool. Grays can be tricksy. So grays that are like a blue gray, or you have to just look at it and, and a lot of times you have to hold one next to the other, which is why this is helpful. Because when you hold them together, you can see, oh, I see how that's a blue gray, whereas that's more of a brown gray. So warm grays are more yellow brown and cool grays are more um, blue gray. Okay, Jack Frost by Seraphim. Liebird Dell, Fox and Rabbit. I don't know how well you can see this. Uh, Dusk, Fiber on a Whim. Medusa's Gaze, Lupin, Lupin, LL, Lupin, something. Uh, anthracite, that's a pretty one. Pretty gray. Flax. Flax, I think, would, it is a cool color, but I think it would trend towards warm if you used warm colors on it, and it would trend towards cool if you used cool colors. And some colors are like that. You, you can kind of use them both ways. Here's alabaster. All right, so let's do this again. If I was going to put cool colors on alabaster, the top, it looks pretty, but also warm colors on alabaster really would give you a pop, wouldn't it? Interesting. And then white. So let me show you white and an uh, well, let's create let me find antique white. If I have antique white. Yeah. White and antique white. I'm not sure if the camera shows, but the antique white just has like, you took the white and you added a little drop of cream and it becomes softer and warmer. So let me take a few of the warms. A few of the warms, sorry for the crinkling. And a few of the cools. Cools, warms, ah. cools, warms. And again, you can use your little reference skeins to hold up to that and see, do these play nicely together? Yes, those play nicely together with the cool. It does not play nicely together with the warms, but it would sure make your stitching pop using warms on that.
So I hope you're getting out of this that you can use warm threads on cool fabrics, cool threads on warm fabrics. It's, it's just going to give you a different look. And maybe if you're looking at fabrics and you're thinking, I don't know what I don't like about that, but I don't like about that. Well, once you start doing more with warms and cools, you'll be able to identify, oh, that's the problem. Okay, maybe I need to look for a different background because of this particular situation. So it's good tools to have when you're a stitcher. Anytime you work with colors, it's just good to have a little more information on warms and cools and how that affects how you feel about what you're seeing. Because again, a lot of times we don't know. I don't know why I don't like it. I just don't like it. I don't know what it needs. I just know it needs something. Well, now you can have a little tool to help you figure out what you need. All right, that is color talk. I can take my glasses off. That is color talk for today. And again, I hope that's helpful for you. It's it's helpful for me when I'm going to switch out things and, and trying to figure out what I do like about a piece and what I don't like. And if I still want to stitch it, but how can I make it something that I'm really happy with? So, all right, just a couple more things will be done. We have a drawing from last time. And that is this beautiful stitching bag from Deborah at the Joyful Stitching Store on Etsy, which I always link to. And the winner of this, you had to use the word favorite, Linda Skinner 5887. Whoops, let me see if I can stick that back on there so I can hold that up. Linda, if that's you, send me an email. My email address is below and we will get this shipped off to you. And then we have a new one, which is perfect for February because it's crabs. Are you ever kind of crabby in February because it seems like winter is never gonna get done? I think that's adorable. Again, thank you to Deborah from Joyful Stitching Store and Etsy. Let's use the word um, February. February, if you want to be entered into the drawing, use the word February. Okay, quick shop news. We have market going on. Market in the needlework industry happens in March and in August. March is an in-person market in uh, Nashville, Franklin, Tennessee, uh, which we always go to. And then August is a online market for shops. And so I'm really excited to go and bring back all of those patterns for you guys if you want to order. We're working every day. It's Saturday morning, so I'm heading into the shop in a couple minutes here to go add even more patterns, more new patterns to the website. If you go to our homepage, there's a big picture on the front of the shop of our floss wall. And right in the middle, it says shop market pre-orders and just click on that. These are pre-orders. We will have them all probably by the third week in March and we ship as soon as we get them. So if you've got an order that has pre-orders from four different designers, as soon as all of those are in, we will stay late, and we work a lot of late nights in March, we will stay late and ship it right out to you. So just know as soon as we get it, we'll send it out to you. If you have non-pre-order items in your order, we're gonna hold the whole order and ship it together because you're paying one shipping fee. So um, if you need something sooner, just order it sooner. If you put in multiple orders, we are always happy to combine them and refund the extra shipping. Uh, so don't worry about that at all. I did bring a few new patterns that have come into the shop that I wanted to show you and then we are going to be done today. Um, let's talk about question of the day because in addition to having you use the word February, if you would like to be entered in the drawing, I also like to do a question of the day just in case you want to jump into the comments and have something to talk about. So let's talk about color. I think I already asked you this, but I, after more color talk here, are you more drawn to cools or are you more drawn to warms? I thought it was so fun to see your answers to that in my Floss Tube 44, but has that changed at all? Are you still drawn to the same? Do you like a combination? Would you like to, like in lieu of the fabrics we talked about today, do you think the opposites are more, you're more drawn to that? So warm colors on cool, cool color, cool colors on warm. Do you like the way that that's harmonious or do you like the way that that pops, you know, depending on what you do? So 
Anyway, answer that in the questions below. All right, here are just a few things. We've gotten some new things from Bent Creek, and I thought that was a fun one for Valentine's Day. Find your way to love. Quick stitch. And we have, they have several of these rows, which I think are fun. This is the nativity row. They have a neighborhood row, which has some cute houses. And so the alphabet, cute houses, some trees. They have gnomes in the garden, adorable. Quaker Noel, you know how I love Quakers, I like that one. Christmas Row, so those are fun. Um, Blackbird just reprinted Winter Wonderland, if you've been waiting on that one. And I love the little pin keep on the back, which the pattern's also included for that. Uh, Brenda Gervais with Thy Needle and Thread just came out with three new ones for Easter, which are adorable. I love this one. I love how the egg tree is in the basket. Happy Easter. It's spring. Again, I need to be stitching these because I need more decorations for spring and summer. This one is fun. Grandma's candy dish. Look at that milk glass candy dish in there. And then we added some of her older patterns because somebody asked me for some of these and then I, when I looked them up, I loved them. This I've already taken for my own self, token of love. Quaker handwork. Boo and Bobby. That one has little felted flowers, which I'm sure you could stitch if you didn't want to do the felt, but the felt adds a good fun texture. Hickety pickety. Indigo Lane. Love the colors in that. Snow for Christmas. Santa riding a sheep. So if you're a knitter, you may need to do this one. And then I told you we had some new um, Jane Elliott uh, patterns in. So here's little Christmas blessings. Joan, not Jane. I knew that was wrong. Blue Delft sampler. Celestial Symphony. Here's an example of how she took a black and then added a pop of color. Christmas blue ornaments. And a lot of these would be fun. Any piece or part, like this one, you could just do one of these rows as a drum or one of these sections as a framed piece. This one definitely, all those different ones could be different uh, pin pillows. Oh my gosh, you guys. I'm going to insert a picture of what my table looked like before I started on this and after because it is a mess. Prairie Schooler, we got a few new ones. What is this? More friends. I like those houses. Uh, country Seasons. Barn Cats. Who doesn't need a bunch of fluffy barn cats? and winter samplers all right i think that's it for today thank you for sticking with me uh it was fun to talk with you i always feel like i'm talking with you um and i enjoy reading your comments below and talking with you in the comments too i will be back in uh i guess four weeks it'll be after market so i'll have a lot of fun things to show you there and um, in the meantime, happy stitching, and I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.